Live from the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, Nevada, HBO Sports presents a doubleheader edition of World Championship Boxing. First, flyweight champion Francisco Tejedor defends his title against the undefeated Danny Romero. And then in our main event, George Foreman makes his first title defense in 21 years against 26-year-old German challenger Axel Schultz. In the same arena, the MGM Grand Garden, where he knocked out Michael Moore to make heavyweight history on November 5 last year, George Foreman makes his first title defense since he lost the heavyweight championship to Muhammad Ali in Zaire in 1974, the first time Foreman has ever defended the heavyweight crown in the United States of America. Hello again, everybody. I'm Jim Lampley. Unless someone else has been so designated in some remote part of the world by a heretofore unknown governing body today, there are at this moment four men doing business in boxing under the banner of heavyweight champion of the world. For what it's worth, George Foreman is the only one of the four who holds the title that has a lineage that goes directly back to Mike Tyson, to Larry Holmes, to Muhammad Ali, indeed all the way back to John L. Sullivan. George Foreman, to the degree that anybody holds a title which is from the origins of boxing instead of out of a can of alphabet soup, is the man who holds that title. Larry Merchant, our HBO boxing analyst, working with me once again. As always, we look forward to that event later on this evening between Foreman and Schultz. And a common question in the sport, Larry, he's accomplished so much. Why is George Foreman still fighting? We all get that, asked that question a lot. My answer is always something like this. George is a fighter. George is a fighter who also happens to be a performer. And he's that rarest of fighter performers. He's also an entrepreneur. This is what George does. Businessmen make deals. Musicians make music. Fighters fight. George just happens to be one of those people who can do it all. I don't think anybody since Muhammad Ali has used the ring so much as a stage. He loves that part of the show. And he also loves it as an office. Proof of which is that he's getting $10 million tonight to fight a Deutsche Mark. What a rate of exchange, Jim. <laughs> so it'll be George's great showbiz value that will be at stake a little bit later on this evening. But first, a potentially terrific flyweight world championship bout between Danny Romero of Albuquerque, New Mexico, Francisco Tejedor of Colombia, working with us again, subbing for George Foreman as he does so ably and so often now, Gil Clancy. Gil, what about this battle between Tejedor and Romero? This fight is a matchmaker's dream. Tejedor is a good boxer, good lateral movement, some power, and an educated left hand. He's going to be in with a pressure fighter that can knock you out with either hand at any time. Should be a great fight. All right. Both fighters are already in the ring. So we take a look at Danny Romero, who scored a spectacular first-round knockout when last we saw him on the undercard of Tony Jones in this arena November 18. You see the record, 23 wins, 21 of them by knockout. It's his first title fight. Danny Romero is only 20 years old. A vast experience difference between Romero, who's the challenger tonight, and the man who holds the championship in this fight, Francisco Tejedor. Tejedor, out of Colombia, has fought 44 fights in his professional career. Maybe it's more than just coincidence that of the 42 fights he fought in his native country of Colombia, he won them all. The two times he ventured outside Colombia, once to Korea and once to Mexico, he lost both of those bouts. You can see that he is a boxer puncher, 30 KOs on his dossier. So Francisco Tejedor makes his first trip to the United States to fight here in Las Vegas. And we take a look now at the tail of the tape for this fight at the 112-pound weight limit. 26 hours ago, Tejedor weighed in at 111 pounds. Danny Romero at 112. But that, I emphasize, Larry Merchant, was 26 hours ago. They were uh, weighed in the last hour. Tejedor was 116 a normal rise in weight from taking water. Romero weighed 125 pounds, an addition of 12% on his body weight. So what that means basically is we have a featherweight fighting a bantamweight for the flyweight championship of the world. Fun stat numbers, Larry. Here you get an example of how busy these fighters are. Teodor is a busy boxer. 
Romero is much the more accurate and harder puncher. But Romero is a boxer as well. He doesn't throw as many jabs as Tejador, but he can fight. He's not just a slugger. And rules of the bout with our unofficial ringside scorer, Harold Letterman. The Francisco Tejador, Danny Romero fight will be 12 rounds. There is no standing eight count, no three knockdown rule. Only the referee can stop the fight, and you cannot be saved by the bell in any round, including the last round. Jim. All right, Harold, now let's go up to ring announcer Michael Buffer for the pre-fight introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and welcome to the world's largest hotel, casino, and theme park, the MGM Grand of Las Vegas, Nevada, where tonight, Top Rank Incorporated, along with your undisputed, undefeated king of beers, Budweiser, this Bud's for you, present an evening of World Championship Boxing, sanctioned by the Nevada State Athletic Commission and the International Boxing Federation. For this first bout, the IBF supervisor ringside is Francisco Fernandez. The three judges assigned, scoring the bout on a 10-point must system, will be Dalby Shirley, Hector Hernandez Bilchis, and Stuart Winston. And when the bell rings, the man in charge of the action, referee Richard Steele. And now, ladies and gentlemen, 12 rounds of boxing for the IBF Flyweight Championship of the World. Introducing first, fighting out of the red corner, wearing gold, trimmed in red, and weighing in at 112 pounds. His professional record, 23 and 0, 21 KOs. Ladies and gentlemen, from Albuquerque, New Mexico, introducing the undefeated challenger, Danny Kid Dinamita Romero. And his opponent across the ring, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing silver trimmed with red and yellow, weighing in at 111 pounds, Con Barranquilla, Colombia, presenting the flyweight champion of the world, Francisco Spoke to both fighters in the dressing room. I'm cautioning everyone to obey my commands at all times. Shake hands and good luck. Romero has a chance to be the most exciting fighter in boxing south of Oscar De La Hoya at this moment. But I find myself wondering, Gil, whether this tremendous fluctuation in weight can slow him down somehow. Well, it, it certainly has to sl uh, slow him down, Larry. I mean, take, putting on all that weight uh, within 24 hours or whatever is, is certainly going to change it. But again, what he's trying to do is take advantage of his strength. He's going to try to outstrength Tejador for the entire fight. Well, we saw how sluggish James Tony was last November 18 after a similar short-term weight gain going into his battle with Roy Jones. He wasn't the same fighter that he might have expected to be. Round one begins. Tejador working behind the jab. Danny Romero lands a looping overhand right. And you're going to see that educated left hand of Tejador's every chance he gets. He's, he's tough to outpoint in a round because he's busy and he keeps snapping that left hand out. Danny Romero insisted to us yesterday that he's taller than Tejador. Tail of the tape said otherwise, giving a one-inch height advantage to Tejador. As they stand facing each other in the ring, it does appear that Colombian presents the taller picture. Romero with another rainmaker over the top of the right hand. That one didn't land. Tejador with a straight right hand that lands for him. Tejay Dorf is a very, very clever boxer. Got very good lateral movement. He can go side to side, especially to his right, when he wants to get out of the way of Danny Romero's power. And you can see that's a good snapping jab that Tejay Dorf has. Man, keep him up. Left hook by Tejay Dorf that time. Romero tries a left hook of his own, glancing blow. First round, a pretty good start in the boxing match for Francisco Tejador. He's scoring with that left hand. I mean, uh, Romero 
is not going to be able to take those punches for 12 rounds. He's going to have to swell up and bust up if the fight goes any distance. Romero trying to get inside to throw to Tejador's body. Tejador moves away. Romero now landing a left and just misses the right hand behind it. They all look so quick and quick in these weight classes, Gil, that it's hard to tell just how much sluggishness might have crept into Romero as a result of all that weight gain. Well, the thing is that Tejador is so quick and so fast that he can make, look, make Romero look a little slow. Very, very clever fighter, very quick fighter. Right hand lands for Danny Romero, and he goes to the body with the left hand. But then you saw Tejador quickly move out to his right so that Romero could not set himself for those combinations, those powerful combinations that he can throw. There's that side-to-side -side movement. And Tejador is showing an ability uh, to go can. to both sides, sometimes to the left, sometimes to the right. It's going to try to make it difficult for Danny Romero to find him. Good hard left hand by Romero. Romero beginning to land to the body, and with that, Tejador beginning to back up just a little bit, Gil. But again, Tejador just came back with a good combination. <laughs> Danny Romero, senior, tending to Danny Romero, junior. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta throw your, you gotta step to your right, Danny. You just get down your head. Okay, Danny. okay, I'll get it, I'll get it. Step to your right, okay, no, te va a agarrar con la, a que te diga, ya te está agarrando con la jab, huh? Okay. No hagas mistake, Danny, no hagas mistake. Okay, that's good. You're throwing it, the, the overhand by itself. You, you gotta, okay. you gotta step in with it, okay? Okay. Okay. Our Spanish interpreter for both step, corners step, in this fight, okay. Hector Garcia. Then step over to your right, and then throw it. And in Tejador's corner, we have Amilcar Bruiser, the former trainer of the great Carlos Manzon. We know that father-son relationships in boxing often don't work, but the Romeros seem to have unusual rapport. Senior has been training Junior since he was five years old. Tejador threw 76 jabs by punch stat count in round number one. Romero threw 33 jabs. Tejador landed at a slightly lower percentage clip. And uh, Tejador is making Danny Romero respect him, trying to take him off that freight train coming right at him. And that's what he had to do in that first round. That's what he did. Romero's last three fights totaled five rounds. So if Tejador can stretch this out a bit, he'll be putting Romero into what is, for the moment, unfamiliar territory. Danny flirting with a low blow there as he took into the body. Richard Steele warning Romero to keep him up. Romero getting just a little bit closer in this round, but the right hand missed there. And Danny is starting to swell already under his right eye. Hard right hand, snap to Hedor's head back. Francisco able to move away and move laterally to the right. Uppercut missed by Romero. Right hand in the middle of the ring by Tejador. Romero jabbing to the body. And Tejador once again ducking away to the side. Maybe not quite as fluid, though, as he was in round one, Gil. No, but uh, I, I saw Romero hit him right on the chin. And instead of him... Instead of it affecting Romero, Romero, uh, excuse me, Tejador punched right back, which uh, good means sign apparently he, he takes a, back, he takes a good back, punch. Break. Seems that way to me. In his two trips outside Colombia, he was knocked out by Humberto Chiquita Gonzalez in Mexico City. No shame there. Gonzalez has knocked out a lot of good fighters. And Tejador lost a controversial decision in Seoul, South Korea to a Korean fighter. 
First time ever in the USA. Danny Romero running out of gas just a little bit in the last minute of this round, and that gives Tejador a chance to reestablish the jab and his boxing rhythm. And as we go to Tejador's corner, our interpreter there is Hector Garcia. Oh, he's, he's, he's so marked. You, you're really hitting him. Listen to me. What you're doing, it's okay, but you have to you keep throwing those punches. This is nothing. That's nothing. Are, are you listening to me? Step back and throw that right hand with power. Romero did land one good punch here, but Teodor took it very well. The job of the brawler slugger in the early rounds of a fight is to slow down the faster boxer. That's why he's been going primarily to the body, even though he's been winging a lot of low blows. He must slow down the boxer so that he can catch him in later in the fight. Larry, with that extra weight that uh, Danny Romero has put on later in the fight, he may not have too much left himself. Round three of the schedule, 12. So far, the fight has played more into the hands of the skillful boxer Francisco Tejedor. Now Danny Romero with a wide winging left hook. And there's a hard left hand. Tejador tends to get in more trouble when Danny's able to pull him into the ropes. him with a right hand he might have gotten a knockdown out of it and again there aren't too many fighters that can move side to side the way Tejador can move you can just see that movement over to the right takes a lot of Danny Romero's power away from him Romero is going to have to be judicious with the use of his power punches to avoid punching himself out as he tries to find opportunities against the slick Tejador That is an educated left hand that Tejador has. He really knows how to use that left hand, doubles it up. Very scored with a right hand lead, and a frustrated Danny Romero wins wildly with the left as he tries to come back in. There's that side-to-side -side movement that really is discombobulating Danny Romero up to this point. Another right-hand lead by Teodor. This time, Romero counters with the right hand and lands flush twice. Top with the right, Tejador gets in a good shot before Richard Steele pulls him apart. Looked like a good sh a shot south of the border to me, Jim. But Romero was really trying too hard with those big punches. I think he's being frustrated by Tejador's effective jab and side-to-side -side boxing movement. Still to come tonight, Heavyweight championship bout between George Foreman and virtually unknown German challenger Axel Schultz. Schultz, only the third man from Germany ever to challenge for the heavyweight championship of the world.
Yeah, just keep working him, huh? Just keep working him. And, and keep pumping that jab at him. See, he's, yeah. he's ducking that right hand, so you gotta keep it here and fire it. Okay. okay. Don't pick that elbow up. Okay. Okay. So it don't fly, so it don't go so so, okay. Put, put so far away, okay? Okay. I said get. Don't neglect that jab, huh? Snake right hand got in. Yeah, Teodor has found something good with this right hand lead. There's a hard right hand by Romero in return. But again, uh, Teodor was moving with the punch. Took a lot of the power out of the punch. Left hand sneaked in by Teodor. Young fighters, Gil, it seems to me, are more concerned about what they can do than what their opponent can do. They reach maturity when they start to measure what the opponent can do as well. Well, that's that, that's the, the purpose of a corner man is to, when the guy's off track the way Danny had been for the first couple of rounds, is to get him back on track. And There's with, a hard right hand by Tejador in the center of the ring and began. But with a slick guy like Tehei Do, I would tell my fighter, forget about his head altogether because the body doesn't move. Once you, once you start feeling it to the body, you're going to be able to hit him on the chin. Coming in, you would definitely have given the punching power edge to Romero. But here in round four, it's Tehei Do who has landed the hard punches, and Romero has lost a little bit of steam. Richard Steele's going to call it a slip. Correctly, I think. But Nothing. Romero's still wobbly, and that right hand lead lands again for Tejador. And two good potty punches by Tejador. Seems to me, Jim, we're repeating Tejador quite a, quite a bit. Oh, I think he's dominating the fight at this point, Gil. And Danny Romero, perhaps too anxious to land that left hand, is giving him a lot of opportunities for the right hand lead. And it isn't that Danny is missing by an inch, he's missing by a foot with these big punches. Again, that movement to the right just took all of the power away from Danny Romero. Again, same thing. And Romero starting to load up with the right hand, perhaps a sign of frustration. There he does land the left, but Tehador again moves away and clocks him with a right hand lead. Jim, now it's a, it's getting to be that Romero is going to have to slow Tejador up. Tejador, if he can go 12 rounds at this pace, Danny's in a lot of trouble. Right now, he looks like about the best champion to come out of Colombia since you had one, Gil. Well, I had a great one, Rodrigo Valdez. He was a great fighter. Round four, a boxing lesson given by Francisco Tejador to Danny Romero. And in the dressing room, Larry Merchant, George Foreman taping his own hands. Yeah, and he won't let anybody else do it, and everybody gives him a lot of distance. He's one of the few fighters, maybe the only big-time fighter I've ever seen who does this before a major fight. And I went in to watch him tape his hands when he was going to fight my guy, Jerry Cooney, when he finished the job, I said, there's no way Cooney can lose. It doesn't even look like he can make a fist. I mean, he's not a great hand wrapper, <laughs> but it works for George. I think it's it part, part of it is, of course, a kind of ritual to get him into the fight. Harold Letterman, after four rounds, how do you score this fight? Well, I, fight? I know I got it a lot closer than you. I got it 2-2, 38-38. Two two, I got it right now even. I gave rounds 2 and 3 to Danny Romero because I thought he got inside and cracked him with a couple of good right hands. And I like the power puncher. But certainly in rounds 1 and 4, without any question, Tejador outboxed him beautifully. And, and right now, Tejador is boxing very nicely. I have it 3-1. to one. And Gil? And I haven't given the Danny a round as yet. You've given all four rounds to Francisco Tejador. So yes. Third round was very close, but I thought the Tejador came on at the very end of the round and stole the round. Opinions varying along an even scale there among the three guys who scored the fight for us. Tejador in the silver trunks, 
against Danny Romero of Albuquerque, New Mexico, fighting in the same weight class in which his hometown of Albuquerque has already produced another terrific fighter named right, Johnny Tapia. Great. Step back. Now, Jim, I don't know what it is about the flyweight division, but the United States can never seem to develop a good flyweight champion. Uh, in fact, Theodore told us when we interviewed him yesterday that he regards Romero as an American fighter and that South Americans and Latinos in general dominate these small divisions, and he expects to himself. Behador's cornermen telling him between rounds, Danny Romero is starting to slow down. Let's hit him in the kidneys a few times, and he'll slow down even more. They actually said hit him in the liver, not kidneys. Hit him in the liver some more, and he'll wear down. Well, Romero must think his liver is up around his cheekbone, because that's where he's going. Solid punches by both fighters. Good right hand inside by Romero, but he was taking body shots from Tejedor. Hard left hand and a right hand by Tejedor. Now he's giving him a lesson on the inside, Gil, which is uh, surprising. No, it wasn't surprising to me, Larry. He's got a very good uppercut with either hands on it. And he can fight on the inside. And he's using that left hook to the body very, very well. There it is again to the side. They trade punches in the center of the ring, and Tejador is out throwing Danny Romero. Three punches to one. Now Danny tries to come back, but Tejador landing the harder shots. Remember that Danny Romero is an unbeaten fighter. 23 professional fights, never lost. Snapped the head back there, did Tejedor. And now a hard shot from Romero. And it's becoming a little bit of a slugfest, which probably isn't good for Tejedor. Well, it, you wouldn't think it was good for Tejedor, but if you watch the exchanges, it certainly was good for Tejedor. It wasn't doing Romero any good for sure. We have a little too much exercise, okay? You gotta watch yourself. Get true, get true. You know, I didn't throw. I didn't throw. No, le estás pegando con la derecha abajo. You gotta hit him in those ribs, then. Okay. You're loading up too much. Okay. You're not. You're not firing right away. Okay. Yeah? Easy. What round is it? Six. Huh? Come on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here you're watching a real professional fighter. Work on the inside, work to the body, the body, three shots to the body, backs Romero off at a distance, and throws a one-two. Beautiful work. Again, Larry, you hit the nail right on the head. A real solid professional fighter. Looks like he can do it all. I don't think he's the greatest puncher in the world, but technically, he's a very, very good fighter. Francisco Tejedor fought in the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles as a 17-year-old. That's the second time he's walked out into the middle of the ring and clocked Romero with, a, with a, a looping right hand, showing the inexperience of Romero. And also letting Romero know that he's in there and he's not going to walk right through him. Tejedor's corner instructing him, keep going to the liver and come back with the right hand. It's been working well so far. And Larry, I don't think that putting on that extra weight for Danny Romero did him a bit of good. Well, I think first we have to recognize that he fought his last two fights at 118, 119. Now he comes down to fight for the title to 112. I, I am not sure of the wisdom of a young fighter coming down in weight. Well, I, I never really like to make my fighters make an artificial weight. I didn't think it was good for them at all. But one of Romero's best right hands just then right on the chin and absolutely nothing happened. Punched at numbers, Teodor outlanded Romero more than two shots to one in the fifth round. Sixth round has also seen Teodor as the more accurate puncher. Hard 
right and a left by Romero. Tejador seemingly unmoved by that. And you know, Jim, uh, when I had Rodrigo Valdez, I got down to Columbia to train him, and all they had, they didn't have a ring. They had a 12-foot square of cement. So you had to learn to move your body and move to get out of the way. And I can see that uh, Tejador does that very, very well. Danny's starting to catch him a little bit, though, here in round six. This has been a slightly better round for Romero than the two that preceded it. Romero going back to the jab a little bit instead of just winging shots that he had through much of the fight. That's what he should have been doing from the first round. He, he went right out as if he was going to knock uh, Te Tejador right out and found out that he just couldn't do it. He couldn't find it. Now he's trying to set things up with a jab. Now the knockout seems like an increasingly remote prospect, and he's in all likelihood behind or no better than even on points. Hard right hand by Romero. But the gym, if you notice the way uh, Tejador is reacting when he gets hit, it doesn't seem to phase him one bit. doesn't take him out of his game plan at all. Haven't seen any wobble in his legs. He counters back. So all this... All this makes you what weight really means. I mean, it's a 125-pound guy. He's outweighed by nine pounds, Theodore. He's getting hit some flush shots by a good, a good puncher. There's another one. And here he is. You know, Larry, I've, I've been against the... Uh... That was Romero's best round. And if that is a harbinger of what's to come, then he's got a shot. Don't stand still. Uh, you have to put your balls there. Move, move. Are you listening to me? Don't stand there. Open your mouth. Do you feel any punches? No. No? <laughs> Did you feel any punches? Are you okay? Okay, so throw more punches. Don't, you, he can't steal that title from you. You have to be the better man. You can win this fight. Put everything you got behind it. Throw, throw, and throw. Get him. There seemed to be a little bit more desperation in Teodor's corner at, at this stage of the fight than you would expect. Maybe they are sensing something about or what that land last round potentially could mean to their fighter. Well, I tell you, in Amalcon Bruza, you got to remember he was in with the with Carlos Manzon and all those tough fights, and he is a very, very good motivator. He just doesn't want to let his guy uh, start to fight the Danny Romero's fight. He wants him moving, which he was very effective with in the earlier round. And Danny Romero has become a better fighter since he started to use that left jab. Hard right hand by Romero. Third time in the fight that a fighter has gone to the canvas, and it has been correctly ruled a slip, not a knockdown by Steele. Hard left hand by Tejador. Danny Romero stops punching for a moment as Tejador comes back with the uppercut. Now Danny Romero is getting himself back together and goes back to working with the jab. He's a different fighter when he jabs Romero, but he's in with a guy with a very, very, very quick left jab. How do you out jab a jabber? Uh, if you can do that, you surely are going to win a fight. Uh, good uh, left hand counter punch there by t uh, Danny Romero. And another good left. Momentum of the fight definitely beginning to shift. Teodor's connect percentage went down dramatically in round six. And here in seven again, it is Romero who's the sharper puncher. Good sequence there by Romero. Now another hard right hand lead by Tejador. And back comes Romero with two left hand counter shots. So Danny Romero suddenly much sharper in round six and seven. And Tejador's effectiveness wanes in response. The thing that amazes me that Tejador can stay with him on the inside. But for how long? Well, he has been able to do it up to this point. There's a good left hook by Tejador again. Hard left hand shot. Romero using the formula of jab and body punches. Just misses a right hand. Hard left by Tejador. And Romero bringing it back. That right hand was a glancing blow. It could have done a lot of damage if it had landed flush. 
And you can see, uh, I've always said that a fighter improves 100% once he wins a world championship. This is probably the best fight that Tejador has ever fought. I mean, he's fighting Romero's fight right now and, and holding his own. Punch it down, punch it down. Don't hold him. What's Romero it? stepping around with the left hook to the body. Much sharper now, Danny Romero. And you see the result as he begins to put combinations together. Earlier in the fight, Romero was walking in and throwing one shot at a time. Now he's jabbing his way in and throwing combinations. That, that made all the difference in the world, Jim. Once he started to use that left hand, once you can hit a guy with a jab, you can feint the jab and then hit him with your combinations. Reach around him. Reach around him. Reach around him, Reach around him Danny. You keep boxing him like that. The guy's confused, huh? Okay. I'm not going to light it again. I'm not going to light it. Okay? okay? Keep reaching around him. Come on. Deciding you hit. Are you tired? No, no. 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 How can you be tired if you were very well trained? Come on. Listen to me. With confidence. Throw with confidence. Listen to me. Con confianza. With confidence. Golpe. Throw punches. Pase por un costado. Pase para otro. Then move from side to side. Yo no voy a levantar. I'll, I'll pick you up. Whatever happens in this fight, Vamos this arriba. is a very, very hard fight for a young fighter to go through. And Absolutely. it can affect him win or lose. Well, he may learn a lesson from this fight. He, he thought he was going to walk right into Tejedor and get him right out of there, and he found out differently. And now he's back on his game plan. Harold Letterman, your score through seven. Larry, after seven rounds, I got it four rounds to three. 67-66, Danny Romero. I think he took the lead in round six and seven. I, I just think he jumped on top based on his clean punching, his hard clean punching, his effective aggressiveness, and the fact that Teodoro stopped moving and is fighting Romero's fight. I have it four to three for Teodoro. Now I have it five to two for Teodoro. And of course, the ultimate decision would rest with Judges selected by the governing body whose title Tejedor holds. But again, you know, it's very difficult when both fighters, neither guy's doing too much, but Tejedor keeps pumping that left jab out, and when the round is close, that makes all the difference in the world. But there's another Romero combination. Once again, the big difference in the last couple of rounds is ability to put punches together in numbers. Well, again, uh, Jim, now this round, uh, Danny has not been using that left jab that worked so well for him in the two previous rounds. And, and while they're on the outside, Teodoro is snapping the jab out every once in a while and gives him an edge in that part of the round. Romero probably have to battling himself or have to battle himself to be patient. Stick with the jab, the formula that served him so well as he began to come back in the middle portions of the fight. Teodoro, a little bit more energetic now than he was in six and seven. Well, again, we, we see Danny waiting, waiting, and Teodoro's scoring points with that left hand. Right hand by Romero. Teodoro temporarily stopped against the ropes. Now he comes away clean. I think Teodoro is slowing down some, Gil. Uh, he certainly isn't moving the way he did through the first quarter of the fight. Oh, well, there's no question about that. In the beginning of the fight, he was just about unhittable, the way he was moving from side to side. Now he's really stopped that side to side movement. He's just following in behind that left hand. No, very little movement to the right. And that's what, was, that's what was really puzzling Romero early in the fight. Right hand to the body there by Romero. Right hand to the head by Romero. Crowd comes alive in a bigger way than at any other time in the fight as they root for Danny to pull it out. The way Teodoro started to faint on the ropes, I thought he was hurt more than he was letting oh, Romero know. Oh, there's no question about that. Yes, he, he was he was bobbing and weaving from punches that Romero wasn't throwing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Round eight ends with a combination and a smile from Danny Romero. Meanwhile, Thousands of miles and nine time zones away, 
the Oder Tower in Frankfurt, Oder, Germany, hometown of Axel Schultz, the 26-year-old who will be battling George Foreman later on tonight for the heavyweight crown. You can see that the crowd assembled there to watch the big screen is not watching Romero and Tejador. They're watching a German television preview of the upcoming Foreman-Schultz battle. Very nice. HBO Sports banner right in the middle of the town square in Frankfurt, Oder, Germany. All I've got to share on Yeah, that's it. That's all we want to do. You don't want to go to the entrance. Okay. The most important thing is to win, huh? Second down. El protector, el protector. You heard Romero say, I'm boxing the stuff out of him. They forgot the mouthpiece in. Going. They got it. They have it in there, and it certainly bothered the fighter. They forgot to put the mouthpiece in when the bell rang. And guys, in round eight, by punch stat numbers, Tejador landed only nine shots to 29 for Romero. So the connect percentage for Tejador continues to shrink dramatically, although he opens here in round nine with a couple of combinations that land. Theodore seemingly going back to that right-hand lead that served him so well early, Gil. Well, the only thing he isn't doing now, Jimmy, is very little side-to-side -side movement, which was the one thing that was really bothering Romero early in the fight. Now he's trying to outfight Danny Romero. He's yeah. on the inside, and he's throwing those uppercuts. From his actions, Jim, the way he's being, uh, Gil, the way he's being aggressive, it seems to me he may think he's behind. Well, the way Amilcar Bruiser talks to him in the corner, he probably does. <laughs> He's fighting Romero's fight right now. He's fighting a power punches fight. Romero ducking and waiting for an opportunity. Lands a hard left hand. Misses with the right, but lands a right hand shot underneath. That seemed to bother the yeah. door, Jim. Yeah, that backed him up. And now he's stationary against the ropes. See if Romero can pick out a chance for the left hook. No, he lands the right. And Tejador lost the lateral movement completely, Gil. He's just going to stand there and wait, and Danny can take advantage of this big time. Well, he's on that cement block in Colombia now. The legs are the legs are not moving the way they did earlier in the fight. When now, told Chiquita Gonzalez caught him against the ropes in Mexico City. He knocked him out. Teodoro's legs are starting to go a little bit. Now, what Danny should do is really start pounding the body because the only thing that's moving now is Teodoro's head. Go back underneath now. You can see the head moving, but the legs are not moving. But for the moment, Rivero is very head conscious. He lands a right and a left. Throws a haymaker left, forgetting to go to the body, which it would seem would serve him very well here. Keep it clean, with a good left hand. And then Romero came back with a right uppercut. He's really getting Tejador's attention now. There was a body shot. Yep. And with that body shot, you can see momentarily Tejador dropped his hands. There are two more good body shots and another hard right hand to the head. Things are starting to break Danny Romero's way as we come to the closing sections of round number nine. You don't see many 20-year-old fighters come back from what he was confronted with early in this fight. There's no question about it. He could have been discouraged early. Come on, open your mouth. Listen to me. With confidence. This, you have to move a little better from side to side. He's, he put, put him against the ropes. Come on. Listen to me. Bien. Hey. Bien. Watch this young fighter work against a really good champion. He's taken the best the champion has to offer. He has the champion backed up on the ropes, taking his time, not getting wild, looking for the right shots to land. Tenth round of a scheduled 12. Danny Romero has been to rounds 10 through 12 only twice. 
Tejedor nine times in his career. Part of the vast difference in experience here, but it is Romero who has dominated the middle stages of the fight and carries momentum into the final quarter of the fight. The holy. That was a cute little thing he tried there. That was amazing. It was like catching a baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Caught his fist in his glove, which can't open. Tejedor's legs definitely now are not the same legs that he started this fight with. Now he has to fight Romero, which is a very difficult job. Especially with that 10 pound weight advantage. Love adjustment for Danny Romero as there's a loose piece of tape. If anything, probably a break for Tejador, who would seem to be the more spent of the two fighters at this moment. Romero trying to become the first fighter as young as 20 years old to win a title since Mike Tyson. Body shots to start out for Romero, and then he breaks Tejador with a left of the head. Tejador coming back with a straight right. There's Romero using that left jab again beautifully. And you can see how it set up the right hand right after it. Come on, don't hold it. Great. Step back, step back. The head door a little bit more active and accurate now than was the case in rounds eight and nine. over the top for Romero. Hasn't been able to get Tejador against the ropes in this round, as he did so effectively in rounds eight and nine. Uh, Tejador, Tejador is now starting to dance again. Maybe he's getting a second win. There's a hard left-hand shot by Romero, and Tejador stands still for the moment against the ropes. Romero measuring and trying to get in a right hand. He misses it over the top. Jim, he'd be so much better to throw that right hand to the body. Right at Tejador's chest. He can't get out of the way of the punch. There he throws a combination to the body and sets up a left hook to the head. Misses again with the right. Tejador just pawing his punches, trying to keep Romero off for the moment. Finally, he moves to the left away from the ropes. Whatever is keeping him on the ropes, it's a bad idea because it gives the impression that he can't get away and then he's taking a beating. And that's a bad impression to give the judges. Hard left hand, Tejador seems to wobble one more time. Romero throwing and missing with the left, but lands the right. Strong last minute of the 10th round for Danny Romero. Two different fights. A punch stat numbers comparison upcoming here, which will show you the degree to which Tejedor, in the eyes of our punch stat observers, dominated the first five rounds, and then Danny Romero, the second five rounds of the fight. And there are the numbers. Rounds one through five, Tejedor more accurate and throwing a great deal more than Romero. Rounds six through ten, Tejedor still throwing more, but Romero by far the more accurate and the harder puncher. Gil. This even has to make Romero more impressive, what he's doing up until this point, than we thought of him. Oh, there's no, this is a great learning experience besides maybe walking out with a championship. Rounds 11 and 12 upcoming. Francisco Tejedor has never before gone to the 11th round in his 44 fight career. Romero has been here once. Harold Letterman, 10 rounds, how do you score it now? Larry, seven rounds to three, 97-93, Danny Romero. I think Tejador absolutely has to score a knockout to win this fight right now. I think Danny Romero's cracking him with that right hand. Incidentally, about that corner thing, you had uh, the round can't start unless the guy's got his mouthpiece. So Richard Steele called time until they found the mouthpiece. I have it six to four for Romero. 
and I have the fight dead even. First five for Tejedor, second five for Danny Romero. But again, Tejedor is not the same fighter that he was through those first five rounds. And Romero is much better. Romero dictating in there now with superior physical strength, greater energy, much better punching accuracy. Jab by Romero. This is not the over anxious that Danny Romero that started the fight. You can see him moving that head, thinking a little bit about defense. Well, it's remarkable that a 20 year old fighter can make these kinds of adjustments, Skill. Good hard left hand shots by Romero. There's snapping that Teodoro's head back. There's that jab again that we said he's a different fighter when he does set things up with that left jab. Right hand landed inside for Tejador. He tries to follow it up, but not a lot of snap in his punches at this point. The more he extends, the better chances he gives Danny Romero to go to the body. Romero triples up with the jab, misses with the right hand. But he's the one who's got a concept in there now. Tejador just reacting to Danny Romero and trying to tread water in effect. And you can see Danny is full of pep. He's in great condition. You have to remember, he put on all that weight in, in, in a short space of time, but he's still dancing, still moving around. And he did look sluggish at the outset of the fight, Gil. Could it be that he worked his way back into condition during the fight? Well, there's no question about it. He's probably, probably taken off six or seven pounds of that excessive weight, probably all water that he started with. So he's physically better now than he might have been in rounds two and three. Looks that way to me. Now you can see Danny moving to the right. We haven't seen much of that. Big left hook by Romero. And, and a right, right, hand. right hand. Great combination by Danny Romero. And Richard Steele pulls him off to end the round. But an excited Romero knows that he has all the momentum now as we get ready for one more round. I want you to box this round. Now I want you to box. And then just keep, keep wearing him down, wearing him down, okay? okay? Don't go out there crazy. He's going to come out, huh? Okay. He's going to come out good. No, no. I are you hurt? Okay, Are you hurt? You okay? This is the final, this is the final round. round. The last round. Okay. This is it. This is the final and last round. Okay. Let's keep it clean, okay? Okay. Okay, okay then. Okay. Just what you're doing, huh? Okay. A solo kind. Okay. Okay. Don't don't just be. Going up and trying not. To and here you see Romero putting the finishing touch on that round, and perhaps on the champion's Second chance of retaining his title. Up to this moment, we thought Romero was a great young fighter coming in here. Right now, we think we know he's a great young fighter. He knows how to win, Larry. There's no question about that. Gil, he's put so much pressure on Tejador these past six rounds. If you are the trainer, do you want Danny thinking of a knockout in there now, or should he be satisfied just to go ahead and try to punch his way to a decision? No, I, I would certainly tell him to box, as he was told in the corner. The big punches come by themselves, especially when you have a guy that's a little tired. You don't have to look to, to go wild and try to knock him out. The knockout can come, and you can see those hard punches to the body by Romero. That sets up the one on the chin. There's a right hand wallop and it'll be interesting to see if Tejador can last it out. His legs totally wobbly now. Romero looking for one more right hand. But you see Romero setting things up with the jab now. And the left hand to the body. And a lot of other good ideas. championship at age 20. You have to give Tejador credit for having a lot of courage, a lot of guts in there. He's still punching, trying, but he's just being overpowered now. 
Danny Romero seemingly so out of sync the first three rounds of the bout, a consistently rising tide from that point forward. He has simply overwhelmed Tejador in the last six rounds with strength, quickness, accuracy. He has that jab. He's snapping that jab out again. I'm telling you, this is going to make Danny Romero an even better fighter than he had been previously. Takes a left hand from Tejador. No snap in the Colombian's punches at this point. Thoroughly professional effort by Tejador, who looks as though he's going to have to taste defeat for the third time outside his native Colombia. Low blow by Romero. It was on the blind side of Steele, and he got away with it. Gutty job going the distance. Tejador didn't go the distance punishment. yet, Jim. He didn't go the distance yet. Down he goes. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He went the distance. Just barely. It's for real. I, I agree with you 100%, Larry. He was in, a, in with a good, solid, professional fighter. A lot better than many fighters that I've seen. And he, once he got himself on track, he we just took the guy no apart. Another brilliant performance by the 20-year-old up-and-coming star from Albuquerque, New Mexico. So barring an unexpected decision here, Romero will have a world title and will move his mark to 24 and 0. Oh. Avocado, that's world title is ours. Yeah, I'm happy. Uh, he was crappier than what I thought. Okay. Okay. I have to assume these are the same things that Danny will say to uh, Larry Merchant when Larry gets hold of him in the ring for a quick interview. Let's take another look, Gil, at the knockdown at the end of the fight. Well, here he has him against the ropes. That's a bad spot for Tejador to be in. And you can see Danny with that powerful right hand. He looks setting it up again. Put the punches together. This all happened just as I was prematurely giving credit to Tejador for finishing the 12 rounds. Well, you know what Yogi Berra said. It's never over till it's over. Finally, it was over. The bell could not have saved Tejador, incidentally, if he had remained on the canvas. So he had to get up to make it through the 12. Boy, that's some crisp punching there at the end by Danny Romero, who outlanded Tejador. 37 blows to 17 by punch stat numbers in round 12. Harold Letterman, how'd you score it? Uh, let's see, I got it. 117, 110, Danny Romero, nine rounds to three. Commanding win for Danny Romero. Incidentally, one of the judges is Stuart Winston, one of the great judges in the world today. All right, and Harold, as you saw, had Romero winning the last seven rounds of the fight. We'll see how the three judges have it as we go to ring announcer Michael Buffer for the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, here at the MGM Grand, we go to the scorecards. Stuart Winston scores the bout 115 to 112. Hector Hernandez Vilchis scores it 116 to 112. And Dalby Shirley has it 116 to 111 for the winner by unanimous decision. And new! Disappointed Francisco Tejador tasting defeat here for the third time in his career. Third consecutive time he's traveled outside of Colombia and wound up with a loss to show for it. Total punches in the bout. And you can see that Danny Romero, so far behind on punch stat numbers early, came back to dominate, landing 40% to only 28% for Tejador. Tejador's jab dominated the first few rounds of the bout, but by the end of the affair, Romero had come close to evening that stat, landing 118, and again, a much better connect percentage. Let's go up to Larry Merchant, who's standing by with the new champ. 
I champion how does that sound the oh, first flyway champion in america in 64 years well i told everybody we're bringing him back to america bringing him back to my great state of new mexico and now we're it now we're here to stay what did you do to change the course of the fight because he was giving you a boxing lesson through the first four or five rounds yeah you know the guy was a very crafty we we didn't take nothing away from him he's a world champion so we just outboxed him we beat him at his own game what made you decide to go back to boxing? Were you, did you feel you were being a little too wild, a little bit too yeah, eager early I was, on? I was too eager, too uh, hyper, too nervous with all you great people uh, fighting for my world title. It was just too overwhelming. I just had to take my time out boxing. What do you envision next? Envision next is uh, going on fighting greater fighters like Chiquita and Michael Carbajal. Uh, that's up to the great Bob Arum to work that. And, but you guys, we can do it all. All right, well, you can do it all. You did it all tonight, Jim. All right, thank you very much, Gil Clancy. I mean, uh, Larry Merchant and Gil. Uh, a look at a kid who has a tremendously bright future. Possible fights down the road against Michael Carbajal, against Humberto Chiquito Gonzalez. Is he ready for that kind of opposition? Well, yeah, I, I think he's, he certainly is ready for anybody right now in the flyweight class. He can really fight. He was tested tonight by a very good technician, and he passed the test. Might he have learned a lesson about taking off weight and then putting on a great deal of weight before the fight begins. Well, I thought he learned two lessons uh, today. Number one, you don't fool around with the weight that way. I, I, I believe as you come in, it is natural weight. Has to make 112 pounds. He has to make it on the day of the fight. You can put a couple of pounds back on with liquids. And number two, he learned that everybody he fights, when he hits them, they're not going to go in one. He started out thinking he could walk right out there and throw bombs and get this guy out. And he was missing and he was off track. And he didn't get back on track until, until he started to be patient and move in behind that left jab. That changed the fight around. Yeah, and with that kind of talent, if he continues to learn and learn well, you have the potential for greatness. Remember, Danny's only 20 years old as you watch him tonight. So we get 12 rounds of exciting action in the flyweight class to begin the evening. That's a bonus because most of you no doubt tuned in for what you're about to see next. George Foreman, who has a big family and takes advice from a variety of different quarters on how to do his business. Daddy? Yes, George? If you're going to beat that guy, you're going to have to throw your hook harder than that. Well, thank you, George. Now go on and play with your brother. OK. Dad. Yes, George? You're getting ready for extra shorts. Keep your feet closer together. Well, thank you, George. Now, don't you have some other business you can attend to? OK, Dad. Hey, Daddy. Yes, George. I hear Axel's a pretty strong guy. Maybe you should be lifting more weight. Thank you, George. Bye. Say that fast, faster. Yes, George. Faster. Well, thank you, George. Now go play. <laughs> Big G, don't you even think about telling me what to do. Bye, George. I used to think I knew how to fight, but there's nothing like sons to make you humble. <laughs> George, if you don't come here right now to take out this garbage, there's really going to be a fight. in addition to George, 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 and the missus, many other distant friends and relatives of George Foreman in the crowd of more than 10,000 here at the MGM Grand Garden as they get ready to watch 46-year-old George Foreman defend the heavyweight championship against unlikely challenger, 26-year-old Axel Schultz of Germany. Welcome back. Jim Lampley along with Larry Merchant once again. Getting ready to look at Axel Schultz uh, in this unlikely shot at the heavyweight crown. Larry, what is an Axel Schultz <laughs> and what brought him here? Well, of course, there's a tradition in boxing that a new, or in this case, a new old champion has a right to take a easy money fight before he takes on a more serious challenge. It doesn't work out that way all the time. That easy money sometimes turned out to be very difficult money. George himself was supposed to be the easy money fight from Michael Moore last fall. Buster Douglas was supposed to be an easy money fight from Mike Tyson. So George picked this Deutsche Mark 
because as an international fight, it could generate more money than any similar fight that could be arranged. But as my German teachers in high school and college would say, this apparently is ein falser Kampf, a mismatch. Mm -hmm. That's uh, conventionaler <laughs> Weisheit, or conventional wisdom, as we say in German. So we tell you that Axel Schultz, though he's won 21 of 23 bouts, has done it against very lightly regarded opposition. He lost one and drew one with the light-hitting mover Henry Akinwande. Gil, is there any scenario by which Axel Schultz could beat George Foreman and become heavyweight champion? Well, Jim, you know there's a roof on this building, so we're not going to get a parachutist no, no. in here. That's for sure. Been there, done that. But he is a game guy, takes a good punch. He's never been down, but he's a stationary target without much offense. I think the only chance that he would have in a fight is if he got lucky and somehow managed to cut George Foreman. Outside of that, uh, I don't think Foreman's going to be an old man overnight tonight. All right. Let's take a look at uh, what I mean by lightly regarded opposition when talking about the fights that got Schultz here. The recent win streak against James Bonecrusher Smith, who was at the time 41 years old and had lost three of his previous four. Jack Basting had lost four of six before losing to Schultz. Troy Jefferson, three of four. Al Evans, ten fights in a ten-year career coming into the Schultz bout. Carlton West, total journeyman. Same two if Kimuel Odom, who had lost eight of his 12 prior to fighting Schultz. So it's not as if he has done great things to earn this chance against George Foreman. Nevertheless, there's great expectation in his part of Germany for the man who's only the third German ever to fight for the heavyweight championship of the world. So here now, a day in court for Axel Schultz. You may never see him again after tonight. For Axel Schultz, growing up in the small East German town of Frankfurt Oder meant boxing as an amateur and only as an amateur. East Germany did not allow its athletes to compete in professional sports, but the destruction of the Berlin Wall and communism in 1989 broke many barriers and gave new hope to an aspiring world champion. Since 1989, everything has changed and my dreams and goals of boxing have finally come true. My biggest dream was to fight for the heavyweight championship. That this dream has actually come true means a great deal to me. While many East Germans took advantage of their newfound freedom and fled to the West, Axel, in making his dream come true, stayed in Frankfurt Oder and resisted financially lucrative offers to live and train under better conditions in West Germany. Yes, I saw the risks of too many people migrating to the West. This, in turn, endangered the East's existence. We therefore decided to stay and show everyone that it is possible to make a successful living in the East. And though Axel has a larger, brand new facility for training, he finds solace in the crusty, run-down gym he knows best. For years, he prepared here in virtual solitude for the chance of a lifetime that is now before him. This place has a lot more atmosphere to offer, and I want to use that for the preparation of my most important fight. I want to use this place one more time for its strength and security. That's important to me. It's also important to Axel to give hope to the citizens of Frankfurt Oder, an area of little visible wealth or industrialization, by nearly reaching the pinnacle of his profession. Yet he does not lead only by example. Recently, Axel donated generously to a small kindergarten whose funds have been cut by the German government. The future lies with the children as the next generation, and the children will be excited when they go home because of our visit. But I am sure they will forget to tell their parents about the money. But when the parents go to the kindergarten, they will see the changes and begin to realize what we are all capable of. Axel Schultz supports the region that has supported him. And despite his fame and success throughout Germany, he has not spread his own wings too far. Well, the few friends that I really have, that are really friends, are those that I grew up with. And they have known me since I was this small, and that is what ties us together. 
we can talk about other things, not just boxing. If they have a problem, we can talk about it. The problem Axel faces now is in the ring. He's only the third German ever to fight for the heavyweight title, following in the footsteps of the legendary former champion Max Schmeling, who fought Joe Lewis, and of Carl Mildenberger, who lost to Muhammad Ali. And as George Foreman's hand-picked opponent, Schultz is a huge underdog. I am quite sure that George Foreman believes that he can beat me, and I will try to prove him wrong. To fight against a legend like George Foreman is a great opportunity for me, and that is where my motivation comes from. Tonight, Axel Schultz meets up with an opportunity he thought would never be his. Not because of any doubts about what he could do, but because of what he was not allowed to do. On this night, Axel lives a dream that he shares with an entire nation. A dream of freedom. Tonight, freedom will line Schultz's pockets with $350,000. George Foreman will make $10 million. We're taking him on in this Foreman's first title defense of the heavyweight championship in more than 21 years since he lost to Muhammad Ali in Zaire in 1974. Well, Axel Schultz is from the town of Frankfurt Oder, which is on the eastern border of the newly reunified Germany, very close to Poland. It's a, gate, a gateway city into the east, which has been there for more than 750 years. And tonight, so many of Schultz's friends and neighbors have stayed up to what is the wee hours of the morning in Germany to prepare themselves to watch on a big screen and root for their countrymen to do what most of us here in the United States think is the impossible and lift the heavyweight crown from George Foreman. We're going to go to Frankfurt Oder right now where RTL television reporter Andreas Dieck will fill us in on the atmosphere. Andreas, it must be quite a scene there at about 6 o'clock in the morning German time. It's fantastic here. Hello and good morning from Frankfurt Oder. We are in the Oder Turm, a big shopping mall in the middle of the town. More than 4,000 people came here to celebrate this fantastic boxing night. And the night started early. Since five hours, they have a big, big boxing party here. Live bands were playing, fashion shows. You had everything you wanted, and the people are just in great shape. All to keep the crowd awake and to rise the suspension, all the entertainment program, and they wait for the big fight. And they will see it on the video screen right behind me. Later, when Axel Schulz will be the new German heavyweight champion, of course, the party continues. Of course, the party will continue. So you're telling me that the thousands there believe in their hearts that Schulz is about to beat George Foreman and become heavyweight titleist. Well, they are quite sure they are fans and they are friends and 4,000 people say Axel Schulz will be the second German heavyweight champion in boxing history after Max Schmeling. Yes, they are very sure about that. What about experts on the sport in Germany? What about German boxing writers and broadcasters, Andreas? Do they, too, entertain notions that he can win? Well, it's really hard to judge because Foreman is older, 20 years older, but Axel Schulz can also do a lot in the ring so they are not quite sure what will happen of course they think he will have a chance and then he will be in box history from zero to 100 so it's really hard to say but uh, i think some of them think he can win yes all right andreas thank you very very much for your report from frankfurt odor andreas deke of rtl television larry merchant there you have it, the challenge that is about to be placed in front of George Foreman. Most common question that we're asked, George has accomplished so much in the sport, why is he still fighting? Well, I think the real question that for us inside of boxing is, is it any different for him now? As champion. As a champion, rather than as the cuddly grandpa yeah. who everybody loved, and now he's a champion. Does that go on? And I don't think so. I think there's something else here. He has to perform up to the standards of a champion. Uh, 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 George is a remarkable fellow in all that, but, but you know, he's won the election and now the hard part, he has to govern, or as he puts it, I push myself to the top of the mountain, can I keep pushing myself? That's the motivation part of it. The other part of it is the expectations, what people expect of the heavyweight champion of the world, even against a hand-picked unknown, especially because George has been issuing challenges and trying to goad Mike Tyson uh, into a match. So I think definitely that he is going to be viewed to that higher standard of champion and not just as a cuddly old George tonight.
Nice recovery, Larry. I led you with the wrong <laughs> subject, and you gave it the uh, fastball anyway. Gil Clancy, uh, has George Foreman proven to your satisfaction that his age of 46 years is meaningless in this context, or is it still possible that George is going to walk into the ring one night and suddenly discover there's no gas in the gas tank? Well, more, more important, George has proven it to himself up until this point that he is able to do what he's doing. But I've seen so many fighters look very, very good, and all of a sudden, one night they step into the ring and they age overnight and they don't have it anymore. But I just don't think that that's going to happen to George Foreman tonight. All right. Well, we're about to see what will happen to George Foreman tonight. But first, one more piece of entertainment from the great entertainer himself. In the present popular entertainment language, George Foreman has discovered that boxing is a little bit like a box of chocolates. Hi, my name is George, George Foreman. Let me tell you something about my life, because Mama always said, life is like a boxing ring. You never know what's going to happen inside it. I know I'm old for a boxer, but this is ridiculous. Shoo, shoo, shoo. I am old enough to know Harry Truman, though. Give him hell, Harry had a lot of fight, but like confidence. When the country ball comes in, Mr. Truman will be defeated by a number of I was the deciding vote when he was elected. Truman then sent me to spy on Germany. I stole secrets from Axel Schultz's distant relative, Max Smelling, as he prepared for Joe Lewis. But the 50s and 60s were really the decades where my boxing skills were developed, aided by some relatives. He's our musical director, a wonderful violinist, and of course, he's my brother George. I was the first to learn to float like a butterfly. But sing like Sonny Liston. I had to bail mean old Sonny out of many situations. I learned entertainment value and improvisation from my friend Jimmy. The clowns have all gone to bed. And a smiling personality from John F. Kennedy. I was taught not to ask what boxing could do for me, but what I could do for boxing. It ain't me. I don't know how I kept getting involved in politics like that. After all, I was just a fighter. But you know politicians, they love a winner. Representing my country and winning a gold medal in the 1968 Olympics was great. Afterwards, I got to meet President Nixon, who told me winning a gold medal was great. And you watch out for Watergate, Mr. President. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. After taking the heavyweight title from Joe Frazier one hot Saturday night, I celebrated all night long with John Travolta. He got famous with those moves I taught him in Saturday Night Fever. You think my rumble in the jungle was tough? What about my trip home from Zaire? I had to change planes in Vietnam. I'm not gonna miss my flight. Make peace now, now! It was always my dream to bring peace to the world, as I told Martin Luther King right before a speech of his. I had a dream last night. Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. During my 10 years of retirement, I became a preacher. But boxing, politics, and celebrity brought me back to the limelight. I gave Evander Holyfield such a tough time in our fight that an old politician stole my line that being over 40 is not a death sentence, I mean 70. Even Nelson Mandela made a comeback, model after mine, after 27 years of absence. For me, regaining a heavyweight title at 45 years old seemed like a miracle. People said that before I regained the title, Peace would come to the Middle East. And the Berlin Wall would come down. They were right. Even Michael Jordan just said, if George can do it, so can I. 
Who could have guessed that a simple fighter could bring such amazing changes to the world? We're going to win some kind of award for this. You never know what you're going to get. I'm humbled by the boxing-related awards I've received. I really don't deserve all of this. I'm just a fighter, and that's all I have to say about that. Welcome back live to Las Vegas, Mr. Merchant, Mr. Clancy. Did you enjoy the movie? Uh, I gave it about three and a half stars. Yes, it's a pretty good movie. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it that Robin Wright wouldn't have solved. Tale of the tape for George Foreman against Axel Schultz. And you see that George weighed in 256 pounds, six pounds over his weight of 250 when he knocked out Moore last November 5. Axel Schultz's weight of 221 is the heaviest of his entire career. Bunch that numbers, Larry. I'll take a look here and see just how active Mr. Schultz is. It's, it's not very, not active, not accurate, but he's fighting a bigger, slower target, and we may see those numbers move up. This is where George has his biggest advantage, that big thunderous jab that sets everything up. We'll see how Schultz deals with that, and that may tell us how long this fight can go on. And Harold, would you like to show us the rules? Absolutely. The Judge Foreman Axel Schultz fight is scheduled for 12 rounds. There is no standing gate count, no three knockdown rule. Only the referee can stop the fight. And as we saw in the last fight, you cannot be saved by the bell in any round, including the last round. Jim. First into the ring will be the German challenger, Axel Schultz with the hat covering his self-described hedgehog haircut. First championship fight for Schultz. Well, this is what a Deutsche Mark looks like in boxing, but uh, he's a pleasant fellow, and if I had met him on the street, I'd say this is a guy who went in the third round of the NFL draft as an outside linebacker from Texas Tech. More than 2,000 fans here from Germany. They flew out of Frankfurt and out of Berlin to come to Las Vegas and root for their man. The amazing thing is that even they hadn't heard of him a few months ago. And you know about his decision victory over Bone Crusher Smith. There's James Bone Crusher Smith right behind Schultz as they enter the ring. He is now the lead sparring partner for Axel. Well, that, that is an amazing thing. I thought maybe he's going to work the corner, walking out, walking out that way. Maybe he is. We asked him yesterday if he thought he had ever been in with as hard a puncher as Foreman, and he said, well, Bone Crush is a pretty hard puncher. Bone, bone Crush is also over 40 years of age. A perfect tune-up for George. 21 wins for Axel Schultz, one loss, one draw. Both to Henry Akinwande of Great Britain, who is the European champion. And Schultz turned down an opportunity to fight for the European Championship for a third time in favor of taking this world title opportunity. Well, Mama Schultz didn't raise a dummy. <laughs> and in fact, German athletes of the world-class level are among the most intelligent athletes I have ever dealt with, which I think is important because Schultz is going to try to modify his style to fight Foreman the way Tommy Morrison did when Morrison shocked everybody and beat Foreman. And fellas, George Foreman's entrance music chosen this evening, Hakuna Matata from The Lion King. It's the Lion King version of Don't Worry, Be Happy. And here he is, 46-year-old, running to the ring. Unbelievable. Let's see if he runs up the steps. <laughs> When he was a young warthog. When I was a young warthog. Very nice. He found his aroma like a certain appeal. He could clear the savannah after every meal. I'm a sensitive soul. Now I say thanks again. Foreman's numerous distinctions include oldest to win the heavyweight title, oldest to regain the heavyweight title, oldest ever to defend the heavyweight championship tonight, longest span between winning titles, and distinctions like these multiply with each passing month and every bout he adds to his long dossier. George Foreman has won 73 out of 77 bouts. He lost in his first career to Muhammad Ali and Jimmy Young. He has lost in his second career to Evander Holyfield and Tommy Morrison. His knockout percentage is the highest in the history of the sport for a heavyweight champion. 
And now to Michael Buffer for the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, top rank incorporated along with your undisputed, undefeated king of beers, Bud Weiser. This Bud's for you. Present 12 rounds of boxing for the universally acknowledged and true heavyweight championship of the world. Sanctioned by the Nevada State Athletic Commission, Chairman Dr. James Nave, Commissioners Nat Carasali, Luther Mack, Crispin Rivera, and Dr. Elias Ghanem, Executive Director Mark Ratner, Lead Physician Dr. Flip Homansky, Ringside Physicians Dr. James Wishgame and Dr. Robert Boy, Timekeepers are Al Bicek and Mike Lachella. This contest is also sanctioned by the International Boxing Federation, President Robert W. Lee, Supervisor for the IBF as Alvin Goodman. The three judges scoring this bout on a 10-point must system will be Chuck Jampa, Keith McDonald, and Jerry Roth. And when the bell rings, the man in charge of the action, referee Joe Cortez. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from the world's largest hotel, casino, and theme park, the MGM Grand of Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! <laughs> Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing black trimmed with yellow. He weighs 221 pounds and brings an excellent professional record of 21 victories. Only one loss, and he has 10 KOs to his credit tonight. He enters this ring inspired by two great German champions. One here with him tonight, reigning light heavyweight world champion Henry Mosca. The other, watching television 7,000 miles away in Germany, the 89-year-old living legend, former heavyweight champion Max Schmeling. Tonight, this young challenger plans to follow their lead. Meine Damen und Herren von Frankfurt oder Deutschland, Axel Schultz. And his opponent across the ring in the red corner, wearing white, trimmed with red and blue, weighing 256 pounds and fighting out of Houston, Texas. In 1968, he captured Olympic gold. And as a professional, his record stands at 73 victories, including 68 knockouts against four defeats. He became world champion in 1973. He retired in 1977. But after a decade of inactivity, he returned to the ring with a mission, a quest to recapture the heavyweight title. And on November 5th of last year, he defied the odds. He defied history. And at the age of 45, he defied Father Time. When at two minutes, 10 seconds of the 10th round, the impossible dream became reality. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the heavyweight champion of the world, Big Obey my commands at all times. Shake hands, good luck to both of you. Max Schmeling won the championship 65 years ago. He won it, and the only man in history to win it in this fashion, on a foul from Jack Sharkey. So that's another way yeah, you might that the challenger can become the champion tonight, Gil. I don't <laughs> think that uh, referee Joe Cortez, no matter what George Foreman does, He's not going to disqualify him on a foul. We might be more likely to see the paraglider. Well, the one thing to watch with uh, the opponent now is the fact that he throws that right hand lead. And if, if he's effective with that punch and he can land quite a few of them, we might start seeing some swelling or some uh, or a cut over George's left eye. And I, I would say that's about his only shot. He doesn't often work in behind a jab, though. He's unconventional in that sense, and 
His critics say that while he does throw the right-hand lead, he has a tendency to slap with it. Well, the, his right-hand lead, there it was again right away. Right-hand lead is about as strong as somebody else's jab. It's not a big punch, but he throws it often. Schultz wobbling backward after one early foreman blow. George off to the predictable, relatively on, slow get him out start. Of well, one thing George should be doing, he should be snapping that left jab out to see if, if uh, Schultz can handle the jab. Get the hands out, though. get the hands out of there. And you'll also notice that Schultz keeps his hands very, very high, which means he can be susceptible to those clubbing body shots that George can throw. And, and when he does go on the attack, Gil, he's got a habit of winging his punches out wide, and there are few better at coming straight up the middle on you than Big George. That's right. Oh, get those out there. Come on, get them out there. Foreman kind of slapping with the jab himself to start off here. Schultz gets in a right hand. Cortez tells Schultz not to hold behind the head while he hits. And again, George is stalking him, but he's not pushing out that left jab. And this is the most that I've seen Schultz move in the ring in all the tapes that I watched. At least he is moving around. There's the right hand lead again. George blocking many of these blows with his gloves. Schultz, the busier of the two fighters so far in round number one. And as we speculated earlier, he is trying to fight him the way Tommy Morrison did, engaging him only on his terms, in and out. Woman with a hard left to the body. Schultz said that he carefully studied the tapes of the Tommy Morrison and Evander Holyfield fights and that he knew he'd have to change his own style to do well here tonight. And there's those clubbing, well, clubbing okay, right hand by George Foreman to the body. I got those out, I got to punctuate the first round for Axel Schultz. And as we go to Schultz's corner, our German interpreter there is Juan Acosta. You, you have to outbox him. You have to be, be calm. Be calm. Okay, be calm. You have to. You have. You have to breathe. Left, you see. Thank you. I know that. Jabs everything. Huh? Jab is everything. All right, seconds out. Let's get off some louder there. George has been faced by previously aggressive fighters who turned into boxers and runners before. He has to know what he wants to do against that tactic. Well, again, again the one thing, a 46-year-old guy, you know, that skin don't hold up as well. I remember the Alex Stewart fight, and if, if Schultz can keep landing that quick right hand, as he did a few times in the first round, they're going to have to start worrying about the swelling over George's eye. Because he already seems to have an abrasion under the left eye. Get him out, get him out, get him out, get him out of there. And again, the Schultz is showing me a, a better jab. Is that right hand lead again? We're going to see a lot of that tonight. And he's showing me a better jab than he's showing me in, the, in any of the tapes that I watched. If anything, he looks like a more comfortable fighter here against the huge yeah, foreman than he come did against the willowy Akinwande, who seemingly couldn't hurt him. Akin one there was a very awkward guy to fight, a big, tall guy, a lot of motion. George just plods straight in. As Schultz had done in this fight with the... George has landed five straight left hands. There's a good left hand by Schultz, but you can see that George is beginning to shorten the distance between himself and the German. So far, the German doesn't show any of the stage fright that we got from 
the British fighter hide when he fought Riddick Bow. No, he's not hyperventilating. Hard left hand by Foreman. Uppercut by Schultz. Good jab by Foreman. Hard left hand by Schultz, and he takes a left hand in return. Foreman's power beginning to come to the fore here in round number two. Come on, Biggest mystery of the fight. What kind of a punch can Axel Schultz take? Well, again, they, the way he holds his hands, if I was George, I'd be going for the body. I mean, you can't really miss him in the body. He keeps those hands very high. Nice counter by Schultz. Oh, get it out, out. Schultz holding his own in most of the early exchanges with Foreman. Come on, work out of there. Come on, work out of there. Work out. left hand and Schultz comes back with a left of his own over the top Foreman beginning to faint before throwing right hand connected underneath for Foreman. George did what he wanted to do in that round at the end of the first round in Frankfurt Oder they were cheering and you have another live look at the crowd there 539 in the morning Watching their man Axel Schultz trying for the heavyweight title. Be very calm. You, you have to move in and out. Uh, are you feeling you okay? Yes. You have to be careful. Yes, yes. Yeah, be very careful. Calm, calm. Keep on fighting like that. Don't go, don't, go, don't go too much to the left. Okay, go on. In close on that round, George did land one very nice uppercut right there. It wasn't flush, but it certainly gave a warning to Schultz, who now is beginning to breathe out of his mouth and, and, and maybe overtaken by the, the the event let's see how he responds here the one thing i noticed larry when uh, foreman landed that uppercut schultz counted right back with a right hand and it was a pretty good uppercut again we, we said he had a good chin he's never been on the deck he just saw the standard schultz combination right hand lead left hook up top and it landed, but didn't do any damage to George Foreman. What about George's defensive capabilities, Gil, slow as he is? Well, you know, he does fall for feints now, and he gets himself a little confused in it. But he's such a big guy with those big arms that it's hard to hit him with a solid shot. Look how wide open he was then when he missed that right hand and lumbered it forward. Doesn't seem to peekaboo as much as he did a couple of years ago. Maybe because he needs to take more chances now to get punches in. George chasing with the jab. He's trying to shorten the distance now. He's always had that good snapping left jab, George. He hasn't lost that. Right hand lead lands for Schultz over the top. Remember, as Gill has told you, he uses that punch much the way other fighters would try to use the left jab. And there's one of those debilitating right on, hands on, to the body on, by George guys, Foreman. They take their toll in the later rounds. Ask Michael Moore. George blocking again with his arms and his gloves up top. the left hand and then declining to throw the right Schultz comes back trying to counter with his own left I think one of the oh, mistakes they're making in Schultz's corner is telling him to be careful I think that's the worst thing you can do with George when you start to respect him too much 
when George throws a punch or misses the punch, you have to be ready to counter, not try to hide and get out of the way. I get the hand up there. Don't hold the head. Come on, George. Get the hand Schultz able to cuff George with a looping left as he stepped away. There's another looping left. And again, Cortez telling Schultz not to hold Foreman behind the head. This is the German crowd here that is chanting and making the raucous noises that punctuate the end of each round. I don't want to throw on that head, all right? There's no need for that, right? Very nice. Ain't nothing there. Everything's fine. You want this here? You want this here? Beautiful. No, we don't want that. Everything's fine. Great. Once you got the jab going, everything goes. Yeah, go on, go on like that. Be calm, be calm. Everything is fine. Come on, take your time. Be calm. Be calm, I'm telling you. You have to, you have to go to him. But try to move out. Okay. Man Manfred Wilkie, the trainer, is saying be calm so often. You know, I wonder if he sees that his fighter is showing a tendency to be anything but calm. Well, he's becoming uh, another Herbie Hyde. Uh, you can see uh, he's not relaxed in the corner. He's breathing heavy in the corner. And there's a good right hand laid again by Axel Schultz. And by far the quickest right hand that Schultz has been able to throw. But uh, they were giving him good advice. He has to calm himself down because that can tie you out as much as anything. George looked like a dancing bear in there. Not exchange. Right hand lands for Axel Schultz, and then another right hand over the top as he steps away. Those straight right hands are doing the work that Schultz wants them to do for the moment. Now inside with a chance to do damage. Foreman tries the uppercut. And Schultz ties him up and steps away. Again, you see Schultz keeping those hands good and high, not giving much of a target to George outside of the body. There's where George should be panging, and that's what he's we're doing now. Hands. Schultz quick enough in that last exchange to beat Foreman to the punch. And look at those hands of Schultz when Foreman gets there, and there they go up again. Keeps his hands very, very high. Schultz doing a good job of taking advantage of his opportunities inside when Foreman steps in to shorten the distance. Well, Larry had mentioned that these German athletes are usually very intelligent, and uh, Schultz is being very intelligent in the ring. And Foreman has heard your advice about going to the body guild. <laughs> Foreman landed a hard right hand to the body inside. Schultz continues to move and jab and try to make the fight in the way that Tommy Morrison and Evander Holyfield did against the slower George Foreman. Oh, work out of there, work out of there. George does fall for feints, and that's what Schultz is doing now. Another right hand by Schultz. And two more snapping jabs. And there's a cut on Schultz's brow when they came in at close court from when they came in at close quarters. Yeah, well, well above the eye, well, the cut way up on Schultz's forehead. Well, you know, scalp cuts can bleed profusely, but they're not dangerous at all. And this one isn't bleeding all that badly for the moment. Axel okay. Schultz having an excellent round four, Gil. He's got to be earning some respect here now. Stay. Stay calm, boy. Stay calm. Yeah. 
Sons. In Schultz's corner, they have one of the it's best so bad. men in the business, in Denny Mancini from London, England. Very experienced guy. Yeah. There's Denny. Be calm, nicely. Okay, breathe in. Breathe in. Borman standing between rounds, as has been his custom in his comeback career. He had brought a three-foot stool with the idea of using it between rounds, but Angelo Dundee, the situational trainer who comes in for big fights, has elected not to bring the stool into the ring. You can see how vulnerable George would be to a really good boxer. And uh, that's why he picked this opponent, because he doesn't have a reputation as a good boxer. Harold, quickly your score through the first four rounds. Larry, I've got it 39-37, three rounds to one, Axel Schultz. I think he's getting in good shots and getting out, but the question is, is can, can Axel Schultz in the eyes of the judges win the heavyweight championship of the world by oh, running yeah. away? And he is running away from George, no question. Somebody had to be on the end of that arm, Harold. He didn't look like he was running away when he landed that right hand. He's throwing a lot of better punches than most of us expected might be the case based on what we've seen on tape. You think they sent the stock to tape, uh, Jim? Because he certainly doesn't look like the fighter, same fighter I watched on tape. Doesn't look like the guy who fought Akinwanda. And the crowd is lifting Schultz up now as he tries to keep bringing it to Big George in round five. Another good combination for the German. And now Foreman lands a right hand, but poses and watches his work rather than to go in behind it. George knew he landed that right hand, though. Got that look in his eye. But he's just being outsped by Axel Schultz up to this point, in my opinion. Schultz with a good fight plan and executing it well to this point. Hard right hand by Axel Schultz. And another. Again, I, I was before the fight, I had mentioned that that might be the punch that George had to worry about, and I was worried about George getting cut or maybe that eye closing from those right hands, and he's been hit with quite a few of them. Come on, come on. Let's go quick right there. So Schultz's right hand leads, doing damage to George Foreman, at least on the scorecards. Remember, of course, Michael Moore, in the eyes of most ringside observers, won the first nine rounds against Foreman, and then was gone in the tenth. Well, we mentioned that Schultz takes a good rap. Foreman hit him with one of his best right hands, and he punched right back. But that right hand did stop him in his tracks and buckle him a bit. And you wonder if Schultz isn't getting a little braver than he should be here. His mouth is wide open now, Larry. But again, he's certainly inflicting a lot of punishment on George Foreman. But the question may become sure. not how well can he take one punch at a time, but how many of them can he handle over oh, the course of the fight? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, I disagree. I don't think George is taking much punishment at all. I was talking about Schultz, Larry. I meant I was disagreeing with Gil. I'm sorry. <laughs> All righty. You know, Charlie, you can do it from fast. Stand back, Charlie. Stand back. Stand back. All right. Good. Come on, ladies. Give me the water. Put my leg down. My, my trunks. Here's that right hand that stopped Schultz momentarily in his tracks, but he did come fighting right back to his credit. He may not be a gifted or talented fighter, but he's a fighter. Game fighter, and he right, takes a up. heck of a punch. Seconds up. And he's got good competitive spirit. And he's in the fight as round six begins. No question about it in my mind. I see you've got him winning four of the first five rounds, Gil. I certainly do. And I took a peek at Harold Letterman score. Uh, he has it the same way. But now George is beginning to land in combination. And Earlier I, it was one punch at a time. And I'm watching another fight because I have George ahead four rounds to one. Wonderful thing about prize fighting. Purely subjective. Go, 
Get him out. Get him out of there. Come on. Get him out. Let's go, guys. Come on. Get him out clean. Come on. Stiff jabs in this round. Slowly, almost imperceptibly, George is stepping up the tempo, Gil, yes, much in the way he did gradually over the course of the Moore fight. of a fight. of a false account or mismatch, it has been up to this point a much better than expected heavyweight championship fight. Better than I expected from what I saw on the tapes. Woman wide with that right hand. Axel Schultz lands his right hand over the top. Body shots, real nice. There's another example of Schultz coming back from a stiff right that he caught and jumping right on George's face. He's a competitive athlete, if not a polished prize fighter. Perhaps oh, that's all he has to be tonight, Gil. Yeah. Well, right now it's a very, very close fight. And he's the younger of the two. Axel Schultz, the last Olympic hopeful heavyweight product of the East German sports machine prior to the dismantling of socialism in Eastern Europe. Fighting against the man who won the Olympic gold medal as a super heavyweight 27 years ago in 1968. Schultz's trainer, Manfred Walke, won a gold medal in Mexico City in the welterweight class on the same day that Foreman won his gold medal as a super heavyweight and gave us the indelible image of the big job corps recruit from Houston dancing around the ring with American flags in both hands. Did Walke dance around the ring with German flags, Jim? Unknown. Good uppercut by George Foreman on the inside. Come on, right out of there. Come on, your hands are free. But apparently, apparently Schultz has uh, earned that uh, reputation by having a chin of iron. He's never been on a deck, and he's been hit with some pretty good punches. And he hasn't shown me any wobble as yet. And if he manages to go the distance, he brings up the question, is it still possible for George to win a decision in a fight like this? Come on, you have 
the free guy. They have the free. Work him out. Work him out. Come on. Thudding left jab by Foreman. Beginning to put more snap in the jab. Schultz landed a right hand, and George came back with a left jab that was harder than Schultz's right hand. Major league swelling over the left eye of Foreman, Gill. Well, we had mentioned that he had to look out for that uh, jam before the fight. If you look over the left eyebrow of Foreman, you'll see a mouse big okay? enough to potentially burst and shower the eye with blood. Huh? Okay. You okay? All right, time in. Let's go, George. Keep him up, George. Warning to Foreman for low blows. Schultz slowing down just a little bit now. Last minute oh, of round seven. Free, guys. All right, bring up, bring up, bring up, bring up, clean. Step up. And finally, Foreman finished an exchange in the center of the ring. So, solid right hand lead by Schultz again on that swelling left eye of George Foreman. If he manages to bring the blood, it could get very interesting. Another hard right hand by Schultz inside. And another. Axel Schultz making his mark on his first trip to the United States. He probably for sure. I'll get it. Not good, is it? No. Come here. I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get it. Okay. Watch this guy's head. When he comes in, that's when his face button you. Well, few observers at ringside would have thought that this would go to the eighth round, but it's a very interesting confrontation now. It's George Foreman with a mouse and heavy swelling above his left eye. Continues to try to bear in on an oh, Axel Schultz who has been surprisingly effective, but has blood in his own brow. That isn't a dangerous cut at all, but if George's cut bust open, that's going to really burst. We saw Angelo Dundee using the inswell on it between rounds, Gil. Well, then, you know, that, again, that's why I think a fighter should sit down on the stool so he can really administer him to him properly. Angelo has to reach way up. You don't get the, the same pressure that you would get if he was sitting down. Put right, left hand inside, coming up and under. Foreman. But you see Schultz come right back. He's a competitor. He, he knows he's fighting for the world championship. And he's still taking these shots pretty well, isn't he? Excellent. Good, good chin. Break up, break up, thing, break up. Come on, get those hands out. I want him wrestling in here, guys. Come on. beginning to try to duck away from those right hand leads he's ducking under them and George, robbing himself of the chance to counter George looks very very awkward at the moment in there look at those jabs landing good solid jabs by Schultz and as Schultz recognizes that George is going to try to duck the right hand leads he switches to the jab and lands both of them flush Beautiful move by Schultz that time, and again slipped that right hand lead in. You get the sense that Axel Schultz gains confidence with each passing minute here. No question. He doesn't realize that he's fighting a George Foreman. Nothing is overawing him anymore. He's just in there in a fight, and he's fighting. 
Now that, that was a little bit of that Tommy Morrison movement that I, that I didn't think he could do. Moving that head from side to side, and George couldn't get off. And there he is with another one, too. Combinations again by Schultz. And he just slides over to the right, and George can't find him. And round eight comes to a close. And you see the swelling above George Foreman's left eye. Come here, son. The guy's butting you. You gotta watch him coming in. You bury him with body shots when he comes in. Okay? Angelo is uh, trying to work on that uh, swelling, but again, you, you see, he didn't he didn't keep that end swell on very long, and he's mentioning it. Uh, Schultz is butting uh, George, but I think it's those right hand leads. You're starting to go. The guy's jumping in on you. Arrow, nail him. eight rounds, two thirds of the way through this fight. Give us your score. Larry, I've got it six rounds to two, 78, 74. Axel Schultz. Like Gil says, Axel's just out fighting him. I mean, he gets in, he gets off that right hand, and he gets out. And he's, he's just out banging George, landing the cleaner, hardest.